Motorsports is synonymous with man and machine at their limit. To win at the highest level, you need more than just horsepower. You need perfect control, perfect lubrication, when every second counts. An engine under pressure needs precision at all levels, and in the heart of the engine, the oil is the lifeblood. When the oiling system fails, it's game over. So, every race is won or lost here, in the planning stages, understanding root cause and engineering solutions. That's the secret to survival, getting the oiling system right. The oiling system is more than just lubrication. It's the lifeblood of the engine. It's the difference between an engine that runs for thousands of kilometers or one that throws a rod after 10 passes. You need pressure, you need flow, but most of all, you need control of it all. Most racing engines, well, most engines in general, operate with a pretty simple oiling system. The original oil pump on GM LS engines is a G-Rotor style pump. A G-Rotor is a positive displacement pump characterized by high volumetric efficiency and smooth, consistent operation across a bunch of operating conditions. The pump appears deceptively simple, consisting of only two main components, an inner rotor and an outer rotor. The inner rotor is driven by the crankshaft and rotates eccentrically relative to the outer rotor. This movement produces an expanding void at the inlet, which draws oil up the pickup tube and into the pump, while simultaneously displacing fluid towards the outlet. This creates flow and subsequent pressure in the engine. Now, the pump also includes a pressure relief bypass valve to divert flow at the outlet if the spring pressure setting is exceeded. Now, while this pump design is very efficient and capable of moving volumes of oil through the engine at several bar of pressure, it is susceptible to certain issues in a motorsports application. Here, high sustained engine speeds place vastly different demands on the oiling system. First, the long pickup tube supplying the pump with oil becomes a restriction as engine speeds climb. This inlet restriction leads to cavitation, or the formation of undesirable bubbles in the oil on the low pressure side of the pump, thereby reducing the output pressure and flow. In addition, aeration of the oil occurs due to large acceleration forces starving the pump inlet and a general thrashing of oil within the crankcase. This aerated oil is drawn back up into the pump, is subject to greater cavitation, and the nasty feedback cycle emerges. Ultimately, aerated oil reduces the hydrodynamic load-bearing capabilities of the oil film throughout the engine, which is absolutely fundamental to its operation. Here, in the 2016 publication by Buono and collaborators, they simulated a gyrotor pump with various inlet restrictions and reported the volume fraction of bubbles across different pump speeds. But not only is the magnitude of cavitation proportional to the inlet restriction, but it also reliably increases with pump speed to as high as 70% free gas volume fraction. That means 70% of oil at the pump outlet is actually air, and is particularly relevant at pump speeds of 6,000 RPM and beyond. This correlates with real-world engine data that I recorded during high RPM racetrack testing, where the engine oil pressure predictably drops off above 6,000 RPM and struggles to recover as long as engine speed remains high, often dropping to dangerously low levels under the highest load operating conditions. So, I'm designing something better. This is the heart of the system, a five-stage gear-style dry sump oil pump. This particular pump actually came from a NASCAR team. It was manufactured by Barnes and it consists of modular pump segments. These pump segments serve a dedicated role, each applying either suction or supplying pressure to the engine. Now it's currently configured with one, two, three, four scavenge stages that are tied together with a common outlet. The pump also has a dedicated pressure stage, which provides the oil supply to the engine. It's also fitted with an adjustable oil bypass so consistent and predictable oil pressure can be achieved. All right, so let's have a look inside. So this pump is considered an external gear pump, another type of positive displacement pump, but unlike the Gerotor, it uses two identical spur gears, which are shaft driven by a pulley. Each stage of the oil pump houses an identical set of gears, only varying in width based on flow requirements. It works like this. As these gears come out of a mesh at the pump inlet, an expanding void between the teeth draws oil into the cavity and subsequently displaces it around the pump casing towards the outlet. Oil moved to the outlet is then discharged by the meshing of the teeth at the outlet and the cycle continues. 
This pump style is also very simple and capable of producing strong vacuum at the inlet and high pressure at the outlet, making it very well suited for the high performance engine oiling application. And while it too is susceptible to cavitation, it benefits from speed optimization by way of the pulley drive and a consistent supply of deaerated oil from the reservoir. Okay, so how about the rest of the oiling system? Well, oil from the pump flows to this heat exchanger. It'll be mounted in the fender well of the car. Now this is a super lightweight uh, slimline Cetrab heat exchanger. It's capable of outputting up to 20,000 BTUs of thermal energy per hour. So it's something to consider that oil in the oiling system is not only a pressure fed lubricant, but also a very effective coolant for the engine. A remote conventional paper style oil filter. This is the last stop for the pressurized oil before it flows back into the engine. Once the engine is supplied with the oil, the oil drains back to the oil pan. But in this case, of course, we're not using a sump pickup anymore. Let's look a little closer at the oil pan. This oil pan is off a Craftsman series pickup truck that uses the LS platform. And as you can see, it is flat across the bottom. There's no big sump in the back as you can see on the conventional oil pan. Most parts coming off of NASCAR application and designed for them are designed to be extremely robust, have well understood and long life cycles, and be readily serviceable, and just overall be fit for the job of motorsports competition. Now the reason there's no sump is because of course there's no conventional pickup tube, and oil is not collected in the sump of the oil pan. Instead, oil collects in the big dry sump reservoir that you see over my shoulder here. The vacuum applied by the scavenge stages of the pump tend to improve ring seal also, and there's a great um, EFI University video that did a back-to-back -back dyno comparison of a five-stage dry sump setup and a conventional wet sump on the dyno. So that's a cool A-B test, uh, go check that one out. The oil reservoir not only takes the role of the sump and the oil pan to contain most of the oil used through the engine, but it also has some pretty important functions in terms of de-aerating the oil. Aerated oil is not very effective at one, lubricating the engine, or two, lending itself to being cooled by the heat exchanger. So on the tank inlet, there is a fine screen that serves as a pre-filter, but it also helps to start to break some of the bubbles that are in suspension in the oil. Opening up the tank, you can see that there's quite a lot more going on than, uh, than you might expect out of a, a simple reservoir. These effectively serve to de-aerate the remaining air or bubbles that are in the oil. This structure is the venting structure. So this allows you to effectively vent the dry sump tank uh, externally so you don't get a pressure buildup on your return side. Now the third and final advantage of the external oil reservoir and probably one of the main indications for drag racing, you always have ample coverage of the pickup tube regardless of the orientation of the vehicle or the g-forces applied. Because of this, the oil pump is never starved of its supply and the pump always has a chance to provide sufficient pressure oiling to the engine. So the packaging of this entire oiling system into an existing chassis and engine layout um, that wasn't necessarily designed to actually accommodate this is one of the primary challenges for creating a dry sump oiling system. Needless to say, there's a number of modifications required to the engine layout, bracketry, drive mechanisms, and also some modifications to the chassis that we're about to get into next. With this prototyping stage and general layout and initial design inputs done, we're gonna start on the next phase, which is where some of the fabrication, plenty more problem solving engineering is gonna take place. Ultimately, it's not about perfection right away with a project like this. This is about learning, set out to solve a problem, work on some new skills and get some new experience along the way. The work isn't over yet, but every step forward is one step closer to making something special here. So um, thanks for checking it out. If you enjoyed this, if you thought this was interesting, I did too, I appreciate it. Um, I try to make stuff that I like to watch that I'm interested in and uh, I hope some of you do too. So if that's the case, then check back and in the transmission build, Torp transmission this year, Torp 2 transmissions this year. We'll be building the updated next generation racing transmission for this car, something that you know is gonna survive abuse in excess of a thousand horsepower and put thousands of miles on the street on it too. So that's the goal. And how the heck are we gonna do that? I'll tell you next time.